Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, in, believe it or not, 1868, the first part of Noster in the world was installed in a building of Oriel Chambers in Liverpool. That's all because it was patented by J.E. Hall a little bit later. Um, <laughs> But Liverpool's always been a different planet, so you know, that's, that's probably all right. Parthenos has mainly been used in, in the UK in university buildings, back of house sort of retail environments, um, certainly not in public buildings, but that's not the case in Eastern Europe, the, the places that Roger's been talking about, you know, if they, if they had a an ancient lift with lattice gates, whatever, they've probably got a Parthenoster around the corner, and it's a Parthenoster that people, people use. Parthenoster started to get a bit of a bad <coughs> reputation by ch uh, killing Chinese students. Never a good thing, particularly when you pay so much money for tuition fees. Um, but that happened uh, in Newcastle in 1970, when um, two students stayed in the car at, uh, during transition at the top of the shaft uh, and as part of that process the one car touched the next car which then crushed the car and, and killed the students within it. <coughs> Never a good thing when that happens. The part of what I'm talking about is uh, installed by Schindler in, in 1964 and then after the accident which was another Schindler part in Oster, uh, was modified uh, that in, in 1970. It was modernised by DNA in 1995, but it wasn't any old, any old part in Oster. Uh, it's in a Grade 2 listed building, and that includes exterior and interior and the part of Nostad itself. It serves 21 floors, so it's not like a bit of a component of the vertical transportation of the building. It is the component of the vertical transportation of the building. 78, 75 minutes travel from 38 cars. The design population of the building 1740, and all we get is a Parthenoster and two conventional two and a half meter per second lifts. So, lots of experts on traffic analysis here. They're not dashing to the computer to see whether it's going to work. They already know it ain't going to work. It just won't work. And there it is. Uh, travels from the uh, first basement level up to the 18th floor. There's a floor above it on the 19th floor, there's a floor below it, uh, which is the, the level of the pit that is part of Oster. I'm not quite sure how I do this. Ah, there we go, yeah. When I first got involved with this project, um, the university had had lots of advice from experts. We told them that uh, the chains had stretched, that they needed new chains, that everything needed to be uh, modernised. Um, and they were also looking at uh, pulling out the, the, the Parthenoster and, and putting a, um, a twin system in, in the shafts that, that were there. Um, people from Connie are smiling. Um, well, people from Thyssen would tell me as well that when I spoke to them about it, Twin couldn't provide a solution that was as good as the Parthenoster. If we'd have put a Twin system in, it would have made a negative impact on, on the movement of people within the building. But it was a big problem. And bear in mind that when you take videos on simple equipment like the equipment I have, <coughs> you get an auto-ranging, so it sets the volume level for you, but even so, and we go, okay, sorry, we go backwards, and we try. Uh, so, auto-ranging, there are plenty of people around the particles, you can't hear their voices, all you can hear is the sound 
So what we did was we, we changed a, a single bulb in there to LEDs that when the Paternoster car was more than 300 mil from floor level illuminated red, but when a car came within a, a plus or minus 300 mil of floor level, went to green. So it gave an indication when it was safe to try and get into the, the thing. So we did that. Terminal floor protection at the top floor, it's really, really, really important that you don't start trying to jump into a car that's already that high because if you do and you get caught above the top floor landing level, you're into a gear that's about that wide and you'll be chewed up absolutely immediately. So we, we put um, a, a, a Memco safe edge to cover that area. Now I want to do that on all the floors, but the university weren't having it. They, they, they thought that nuisance stripping was going to be more of a, a problem than, than the rest of it. Well, we put it on the terminal floors, and, and that has given us an increased uh, safety to that. English Heritage. <coughs> oh. There's a lady from English Heritage who was fascinated by the essential verticality of the building. Okay? And was insistent that we restore the thing to its original finishes. Well, the block at the back of the room here managed that for us. He, he provided us with some stripe pattern stainless steel in a very thin gauge. So we ripped off all the MDF and we ripped off of the four marker. We took all the cars back and, and had the cars shot plastered and, and cleaned and painted. And by the time we would finished with the modern materials we were using to pack on the stainless steel, we managed to get the cars back lighter than they'd been originally. <laughs> The gearing was absolutely worn out. Fortunately, um, local to the University of Sheffield, relatively, is, is uh, uh, Huddersfield, uh, and there's a company there called Highfield Gears, and they simply took everything away on the back of the wagon. I had a slide on that, but couldn't find it. Um, the, 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 all the gearing components went on the back of the wagon and, and away. It, now, if that wagon had been involved in, in a motorway accident, then it would have been a static display because, because there would have, have been no way you could have uh, rebuilt it. And so they, they put the new gears in and it will give at least another 30 years. <coughs> I'm, I'm much more confident about that now. We had the opportunity, of course, of improving diagnostic displays. Um, you know, in 1964, if you had a little lamp that came on, if somebody Press the stop button, that was pretty cosmic. Uh, we, we could do more than that, and we did. One of the other features of, of accidents was the fact that the grab rails that are on both the car and the, the landings had flat tops. And two of the accidents, uh, uh, two of the four accidents, had involved people who'd managed to get their arm in between a landing and a car grab rail, and, and on two cases, the to end up with broken arms. And I very, very nearly was, was the third because it happened to me as well. So all we did then was we, we put, we, we put a, a chamfer on the handrails which pushed your arm out of the way uh, and that, that resolved that. When we took the cars out, taking cars out is a big job. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a thing you do lightly. So we take the cars out we get them back to the university kindly lent the contractor uh, a workshop that they could do all this work in storage, storage for it. And when we strip the cars down, out of the 38 <coughs> cars, 32 of them had cracks in the structure of the car. Um, the sort of cracks that had resulted in the fatalities in Newcastle. Now, had I been anywhere else in the world, at that point in time, as uh, a consulting engineer who specializes in lists, not really part of it, um, I would have been a very worried man. But I took 
of you. We're in Sheffield. It's the home of steel. We're at the University of Sheffield. It's the home of people who know about steel. Why don't we get one of their boys to have a look at this? So we got <coughs> Professor Adrian. Professor Adrian had a bit of a problem. He retired, but was kept on because his wife said to him, Adrian, I managed you for better and for worse, but I didn't marry you for much. <laughs> so he needed to find something to do with his time. And he gave us lots of his time. So what he did was he, he took some strain gauges and completely wrapped a uh, car fleet with strain gauges and, and a monitoring device and cycled it around the, the, the whole of the parking lot. So it's the only thing there, nothing else is there, just that. And when he analysed it, he, quite simply, he found two things. He found, firstly, the reason that the cracks had, had developed, and, he, and very simply, out of his expert uh, knowledge of metallurgy and the design, he found that the, the modification that Schindler had done was about right, but significantly not right. So what he found was that, the, uh, if you imagine, we've got two guides in each shaft, so we've got four guides. And, and normally, with men, we, we're used to setting guides up in pairs, and, and we pay a little heat in a, in a multi-car group so that we don't end up with one landing door in front of another. But it's not that critical. In part of us, it's mega critical. You have to align all four guides perfectly. And at the top of the guides, there's this um, <coughs> a, a, an element called the spear point. And it is very much like, like a spear. It's where the guide goes from its full width, that they're all timber phase. Uh, and it comes up in, in a point. And the problem is, in three dimensions, if those points aren't aligned, then when the car comes out of guidance and is dropped into guidance, then it will twist. And if it twists, then it's going to put stress on the structure, and that was what was causing the problem. So we got expert advice from within, and, and we solved that problem. Then they discovered some white stuff in the basement. And the whole bloody project stopped six months. We, we had to just completely come off site because we couldn't put the cars back in. And, and we couldn't go anywhere near the basement. The basement, the, the Paternoster was the only thing that was connecting the, the sub-basement to the rest of the building because it was on the same level. So we were banned. Delays and delays and delays. We had a final deadline of the 21st of September <coughs> 2011, Freshers' Week. And we got there, eventually. It was Bit pretty sort of last minute stuff. One of the things that I had to do was had to write uh, an inspection sheet because the Paternoster, like linguists in general, have always got more things to stop it than make it go. <coughs> but a Paternoster is the ultimate extreme of that. There's only one device that will start a Paternoster, and on this one, there's 138 that had stopped it. <coughs> so you had to make sure they all work, didn't you? <laughs> And no, nobody had ever done that before, as far as I can tell, not the, the one the standard test sheet uh, available to do that, so we yeah. to do that. Then there's, there's a, a bit of a postscript. I was at uh, the uh, uh, Augsburg exhibition two years ago. And uh, I got a, an email, and suddenly I'm looking at Richard, and it was concerning an accident that had happened the previous year in Holland, when a 90-year-old man, when you get a report on an accident on a Parthenoster, and it says, on the so-so-so-and-so, a 90-year-old man, you think to yourself, what is a 90-year-old man doing on a Parthenoster? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that, ignoring that, uh, this, this guy um, <coughs> stood on the plate that's at the front. Parthenosters have flaps. Uh, on, on, a, on a landing, there's a flap, so that if you caught your shoulder underneath it, the flap would just 
lift up and, and you'd be okay. And similarly, the cars um, at the front edge got flat. Well, this flat collapsed and he fell down through it. Uh, and it looked for a period of about 48 hours like all Parthenospas in Europe were going to be banned. And it didn't feel right to me. Uh, well, this, this can't possibly apply to my Parthenoster. And indeed it didn't, because the Schindler design, yes, it's a piece of wood, yes, it's on a hinge, but it's got a metal frame. And there's no way on, on this planet that a, a, a piece of wood that's, I think it's perhaps uh, inch ply, marine ply, there's no way that that could degrade to that state. And they're all new hinges. So in the final, in the, in the Netherlands, it was inadequately supported, and, and that was what the cost of the result. But I've got a bigger, bigger problem. We, we continue to have little episodes on the part of us. Yeah, we've had ladders. We've had ladders. We, we had somebody put a ladder in and go through the roof of one of the cars within five days of putting the thing in the service. So part of the induction process that all of us who work for the University of Sheffield have to go through once a year is a little bit in that induction that says this is a part of an oster, that's a ladder, that's a big box, that's good. You don't go anywhere near a part of an oster with any of these and if you do you won't be coming back on site. So that helped a bit. <coughs> the only person it didn't help much was the third year architecture student who'd spent a whole year building this perfect model of a building that she was planning. Uh, it was a very large scale model and as she got in to the part of Oster, she tipped it and caught it on the roof and the next thing you knew it was about that big. <laughs> a whole year's work destroyed in, in, a, in a, a moment, absolute moment. But safety, of course, isn't, we, if we talk about safety, we see safety in, in a cultural context. Now, you may all consider partners unsafe because they never stop, there's no doors, so in your mind that may be unsafe. But I ask you this question, have you ever been on the London Underground? Not only is there a platform with a drop, a big enough drop for it to be considered a risk on its own, but then there's that big lump of electricity that runs, runs along it as well. And how many people every day use the London Underground? Well, it's about a million. So, I've only got a few people using my partner at the University of Sheffield. We have very few accidents when we do have incidents, those incidents are becoming increasingly perceived as serious issues. My guess is, within the next four or five years, our perception of risk will lead to partners to be taken out of service. It's got at least another 50 years life in it as a machine. It, it, it can continue to work, but will <coughs> our cultural norms allow us to do it? On the other side, we've got 2012, the Partenoster in Berlin was actually a new Partenoster was installed. <coughs> last weekend, I had an email from my, my boss asking me how we could build another part in Oscar, what, what, what would have to be done. But the cultural norms of Berlin and the cultural norms of Sheffield are not necessarily the same. Finally, I would just like you to hear the part in Oscar as it was on Monday. There we go. All you'll hear
can't get 13 persons in a 13 person car, but you can get three people in a two person car to not. <laughs> 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 <laughs>